is Anna Olson, and I'm the host for, for the, the seminar today. And it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Thomas Norton from the University of Leuven in, uh, in Belgium. Uh, Thomas Norton has a PhD from um, University College Dublin in Biosystems Engineering. And he leads uh, a group of research at the University of Leuven that works on precision livestock technology, uh, which is a, a term that can stand for many things. And I know that, that um, Thomas Norton's group's research really represents a lot of variety of um, approaches to use technology to collect data on and to monitor animals' health and behavior and, and welfare. Uh, and uh, Professor Thomas Norton is definitely one of the absolutely leading European experts on this. And it's a privilege to have uh, you here, Thomas, for, for this talk. Mm -hmm. And the, the floor, the, the web is yours. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, Anna, and I really appreciate the invitation. And uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here and to just share some of the things that we we've been doing with you, and maybe stimulate some ideas on what can be done in the future, and perhaps collaborations. Also, who knows? Um, should I just share my screen now? What? Coming up. Is it okay? Yes, yes. Yes, okay. Yes. Yep. Okay. Perfect. So I'll get started. So um yeah, like I said, thank you very much. And uh, indeed, what Anna said is perfectly correct. Uh, PLF is kind of a, a term that captures a lot of different uh, ideas and concepts. And um, what I'll speak about today is the use of precision livestock farming tools actually to support welfare monitoring. Um, because really, in the past few years, that's been quite important focus of uh, particularly the research in precision livestock farming tools. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll cover a, a lot uh, of the recent research that we have been doing in that direction. Um, in terms of uh, the reason why we even do it at the beginning is because uh, we know that uh, it's, of course, a challenge for farmers to manage uh, farm animals in large numbers. Um, because, of course, there is a, a heavy labor cost associated with that. Um, and the general trend across Europe and globally, actually, is that the farms are becoming more efficient. And because they're becoming more efficient, um, they need, uh, yeah, uh, they can farm more animals and they have less people managing these, these animals. And um, because of that, coupled with the fact that uh, there's a large amount of volatility, volatility in the livestock sector, particularly when we look to the feed price, and uh, yeah, when we see and take into account that this is about 50 or 50, even more 60 percent of the uh, the cost of uh, growing animals, we can see that yeah, there is a need for additional support for the farmer in order to keep them not alone making money but even in business sometimes it's a real struggle for them and the the challenge that they face uh, and the corresponding effect of the the lowing number of farms and the increasing number of animals being farmed per uh, per farm itself is a challenge witnessed throughout the world and that we see from europe now that yeah, with the Green Deal, they're trying to bring farming back to smallholders and medium-sized farms. Maybe they will be successful in, in doing that. 
but there will always be this resource efficiency challenge that that's facing. So we, we will see in the future where that goes. But the real challenge, and I think this is where farmers need support now, is that they can no longer give the individual attention to, attention to the animals that they used to do in the past. Um, in the past, they could, uh, yeah, they knew by the behavior, they had the opportunity, for instance, to go into the milking parlor and milk the, uh, yeah, recognize if there was problems with, with the milking cows or even in the building itself, see if there's one cow that's not eating properly and so on. The farmers did a lot, but now because they have so many animals, they don't have that kind of capacity anymore. That's why you, we see on the, the, the market, we see commercially that there's more and more tools coming out to support the farmer. Um, and really a, a lot of these tools are supporting him to make correct choices to, that will improve his efficiency. For instance, on the left-hand side here, you see this green uh, bolus, uh, which takes measures of rumen pH uh, in order for the farmer to optimize his uh, feeding rations. Um, there's other devices coming which are also supporting efficiency, but maybe through the monitoring of health. Uh, for instance, the microphone here, and I will go into that a little bit later, as well, gives a signal that is uh, related to the respiratory health uh, of the animals. The first application for this company, Soundtox, is in pigs, but they are also looking to other species. Um, so there is very interesting technology coming out that will hopefully support uh, the farmer to manage his livestock and to do it in a more health and, and welfare friendly manner. Um, and what we are trying to do is to support uh, the animal. In fact, the animal for us is the main stakeholder. Uh, it's the one that's taking these inputs. It, uh, the animal has a certain genetics. It, it, it can't help it. Uh, it's bred in a certain way for the production system. But then we change the conditions like the environment, feed and water around the animal. And of course, when the animal is in, subjected to challenging conditions, which they are sometimes with the climate, perhaps uh, the temperature is uh, fluctuating above a comfort, comfortable level for them or the feed composition has changed. Uh, we would like to monitor the response of those animals. I, I put video monitoring here. Actually, it can be many different tools that we, we monitor the response. Uh, a focus of ours has been video monitoring. Um, and of course, we like to extract different uh, indicators of health behavior, growth, emotion and stress, and eventually move towards supporting the sustainability of the farm. So that's our ambition uh, and driving factor to, to, to develop these tools. In the research team, we have long, for a long time, back since the 90s, um, this scheme, uh, as a core uh, method for us to follow. And basically, it basically says that there is a process at play and the process is for us, uh, the livestock production process for producing pigs, uh, uh, milk or eggs uh, or chickens. And yeah, in the end, uh, we know that these animals in the system are subjected to inputs and then they will respond in a certain way. And here I have measure underneath both of these because we know we can start measuring things now with sensors. Uh, many different devices are out there to do that. And if we can measure in a good way, we can actually start to produce a model representing that animal. And that's the work that we do in our, in our research team. We try to model as close as possible this uh, animal uh, and then try to uh, determine when there is deviations from the normal state. But of course, it needs a lot of support from different disciplines. And uh, well, I'm, our research team is very lucky to have uh, very good colleagues uh, in many of these fields. And um, if I think the, the most important fields to us uh, at the moment would be in the ethology and physiology side. So we're, we're uh, working 
on the ecology side, mainly around the, the welfare questions to uh, develop technology to improve the animal welfare. And of course, this modeling part is really the technical part, but that's when we join up with the, the other disciplines and together. And this is a real collaborative effort, I have to say. There's no one winner here sitting behind his desk trying to realize everything. You can only work in a team and together we can deliver a solution. And that's uh, what we are trying to, to work towards, to living, delivering uh, help to the farmer and also uh, technology that can support as well the research to improve the systems that animals are in. So it, this is the, the system that we try to follow. Um, and because we're engineers, we like to play around with sensors and signals and uh, this is a scheme that basically shows uh, the general flow of things that we do. Um, we take a sensor, we process the signal, then we start modeling the signal, uh, applying real-time models, because in the end, we will expect that these technologies to run uh, in real time, because the animal changes behavior or uh, different states very, very quickly. And we extract information from these uh, real-time models and link them with the physical or mental state of the animal or the physiological state of the animal. And then information can be given to the uh, caregiver, caretaker, farmer um, to, to uh, support any interventions that will be done. So that this is the, the general flow. It's a theoretical approach, but it helps guide uh, all the work that's being done. And one key factor is that this model that I talk about, it's a mathematical model. Um, it's a dynamic model. It's an individual. It's a model actually following each individual animal. And so we update this model, respecting the fact that every animal will also change uh, over time. Animals will grow. Their, their perception of the environment around them will also change. And we have to build that into the model. So we, we try and uh, follow an approach where uh, we continually update the parameter in this model so it reflects the, the system that you're monitoring there and then. Um, I just want to show, first of all, before going into the detail, the different lines of work that we are, we're following here. So we have uh, a particular line on uh, poultry uh, production. Uh, we focus part of that on hatching, so looking to uh, develop um, technologies that can reduce the hatch window in, in uh, commercial incubators, for instance, uh, and even reduce the, the, the stress uh, within uh, these kind of uh, machines. Um, we would all, we're also looking to the production side, the growing of, of broiler chickens, monitoring the behavior of those broiler chickens and uh, uh, capturing information on their welfare. And also, when it comes to layers, uh, looking at IPM strategy, uh, IPM stands for Integrated Pest Management. I'll talk a bit more about that because uh, this is actually a welfare issue in, in the layer sector, um, but more on that later. We have also a line of work on pigs. Uh, we're lucky enough to have very nice collaborators uh, in the pig field. Uh, specifically in the breeding of pigs, we work a lot with PIC, the pig improvement company, and uh, we aim to try and extract new phenotypes that they can utilize in their, in their um, breeding programs. Um, and also we, we uh, in the past, also had a very strong collaboration with other companies uh, like Fancom um, uh, to, to monitor the uh, the growth and the welfare of the pigs. Uh, and nowadays, we're still continuing work on monitoring the welfare of the pigs. And I'll also uh, show you the applications on that in a few minutes. So what I wanted to do, first of all, was um, before I go into the different types of things we, we work on and show you that, was to give an insight in how do we collaborate with people to build these PLF tools? Because like I said a few minutes ago, it's really not a, a job that can be done by one person behind his or her desk or 
or somebody who believes they can do it all on their own. It's really a collaboration across disciplines. And, and, and this is something, this scheme has been started up by my predecessor, who was a pioneer in the field. And then basically we're following this approach ever since, and it's working. Uh, and and uh, I want to give an overview of uh, how we, we go about this uh, kind of uh, development uh, for a case of pig, pig, pig sound uh, monitoring, effectively cough monitoring of pigs. pigs. Um, and the main challenge is, of course, reducing the use of antibiotics in, in pig houses. And yeah, we, we see in the, in the sector that commonly, if a pig uh, is infected by typical viruses like influenza or uh, microplasma, they, they will uh, develop a, a lung infection and then that can lead to coughing and, and so on. And this coughing, of course, can be measured if we have a microphone to measure. So the, the, the challenge there was to, if we put a microphone in the pig house, can we uh, pick up the sound? Can we develop an algorithm that will detect infection status? The infection status is the target variable. And that means, of course, we need some idea of the quality, I mean, the, the accuracy of this being uh, measured as an infection. So it's a gold standard. It has a, a re, an accepted uh, scientific approach to measuring this infection uh, needs to be uh, used in order to classify this as an infection or not. So that, that's one way to validate, of course, what we developed by implementing this gold standard. The sound is, developed, uh, is uh, captured at a very high frequency. We have to develop an algorithm that's the, the, the core algorithm that will count the number of coughs. But there, actually, you need another level of collaboration, and that's with people who will label the data, who can look into the data uh, and correspond it with the actions of the animals on the farm. Here, it's about coughing, but when it comes to other applications of welfare, when it's like behavioral related, Actually, the ecologist needs to look and look to the sequence of behaviors and label those on the video. So that's the, the other aspect of the uh, collaboration. So these two things are, are very clear where we need um, not just computer scientists, we need biological people to work hand in hand, whether to vet people from um, the, the health uh, side uh, or immunologists uh, or veterinarians who can the, the measurements. And then finally, the people working on the label, labeling of the, the data coming in. So these are the kind of collaborations that are, are key. And I'll just go through some of the processes here. So this is labeling of, uh, of coughing. So someone uh, going through this would identify the moments where the pigs are coughing to zoom in on different areas where it's difficult to, to do so. And the, the company that we collaborate on that was uh, Sound Talk some time ago. Um, and of course, then once that data is there, uh, it can be, it's important then to, uh, yeah, first of all, do, do this labeling. So that's the, the key step here. So the, the signal is there and then you count the number of coughs by the uh, labeling process uh, and then extract features from that uh, signal that you've received so from the microphone signal and that's where we implement the the dynamic equations these are just uh, what we call transfer functions that look to time varying signals to extract parameters that we then use to classify uh, the the different um yeah conditions or indicators, pop being one of them. So here is just uh, an overview. So we have measured the data. We have an algorithm then for counting the number of talks. Um, and that's what we can track over time in the signal. So that's the first step uh, in this done. But then we, of course, we need to work with the veterinarian or with the immunologist, someone who's taking the gold standard and then we'll do the classification. So there is a second level of algorithm development, the whole classification step, 
Um, and this will take that future variable into the, the, uh, the, the yeah, it'll link it with uh, the knowledge on the infection level of the animal. And then, of course, we have to do a, a whole validation step um, and again compare the, the uh, feature extraction and the classifier with uh, the real values measured uh, for a completely new um, data set. And this is a validation step that we do. But this, in, in, in essence, is the whole process uh, that we follow to, uh, to build these uh, tools together. It's worked for the last 20 odd years, and I think it will continue to work um, and what it really means is that we need to speak the same language to each other and be willing uh, to get out of uh, the comfort zones and, and discuss things. Okay, so now I'll just go on and talk about some of the applications that we have. Um, yeah, this, I guess, sets the scene a little bit in terms of where the, the whole development has gone. So back in the 1990s, there was already people looking to measure the animals, uh, looking, for instance, focusing on measuring the weight of the animals. And it all began in 19, the, the early 90s with uh, scientists in Silso um, looking to measure the weight. And then this technology passed into the hands of some of the commercial companies, but it never really took off because it wasn't accurate enough. And there was a lot of challenges, of course, with dust and, and so on. But then more robust technologies have come on the market. And I, I'm just putting this here to say that now we're in the phase where actually these robust technologies that have come from the consumer market, like the technologies on the, the right hand side here, are coming from the solutions game the gaming uh, industry yeah like your xbox uh, exactly. and so on these technologies are actually developed to such a robust level that we can implement them in practice so now we're seeing a really strong market we're seeing a, a growing pull from industry and of course that helps us to uh argue our, our, our basic motivate our uh, work here and uh, and try and move towards improving uh, these tools. And also recently we, we've seen that it's not just measuring production indicators like weight or feed intake or so that is very important, but actually there's companies coming up who believe that monitoring the, the behavior of the animals are very important and can help the farmer as well, and particularly quantifying his welfare. And these are just two different companies that I have come across recently. And they're focusing on identification of these pigs and capturing the individual behaviors of these pigs. And I think it's a really nice uh, progression to see that uh, these tools are starting to come in the, in the hands of farmers. Um, in our work, we want to push, because we're a research team, of course, we want to push beyond the state of the art that's that's in the, the industry. And we want to really understand individual behaviors. So our, our focus on the peak behavior monitoring is to implement tools at the moment, focusing on video monitoring, because that's really useful to capture uh, visual behaviors of the animals um, and uh, track those animals, determine uh, particular behaviors of, of importance um, eating, drinking are, very, are quite simple. We've all done all that stuff in the past, but actually the interaction behaviors, the social interaction, and we get in relevant information from these individual uh, pigs that can be indicate, indicative of how they fit into their social hierarchy. Very interesting. Um, but of course, there is technical challenges, for instance, who, where, when, and what. It's not always that we can con continue tracking individual animals. We, we often end up uh, with losing tracks because of illumination issues, because of the pollution issues. Um, but that's the technical challenge. And that's why we, we research, because we hope in the end we can get a solution. Um, we want to go for long-term monitoring. And like I said, we have these, these ambitions that are on our table. And the first one I think we've solved 
to at least to a good extent. We know how to do it, but the pairwise interactions, we still have a lot, lot, lot of way to go there uh, to understand these social interactions from these tools. So um, that's uh, a core business for us at the moment. Um, I, I decided to just present some of the key ideas that we have had in the past um, and where we're going now. What I don't expect is that you follow each individual idea, but what I want to say is that um, yeah, we started, uh, at least when I began here in 2016, uh, we focused, started focusing on the video monitoring using traditional computer vision techniques. And these are techniques that yeah, many, many behavior monitoring tools that are available, say open source tools that are available, or even tools from, from companies that monitor individual animal behavior. They're based on traditional computer vision uh, tools. And, but we started to see, looking in the computer science field, that deep learning is an approach that's on the tip of everybody's tongue. But uh, we wanted to see really what kind of impact it could it make um, in this field. And really, we were pleasantly surprised. Uh, we could start to separate fine scale behaviors um, that weren't possible before we could before using deep learning. So. It really opened our eyes and became very interesting to us. And you can see, we started with computer vision, um, uh, which is in red there, and all the other applications, ideas, publications were coming out, uh, incorporated uh, deep learning, because we don't see a way back. It's really fantastic in terms of uh, tracking behavior monitoring, and we see it part of the future. Um, and in the end here, we're at the stage now where we can start tracking animals. We lose tracks. Um, and I think it, this is a big challenge, but one we, we, we try and uh, deal with in the future. Um, but it's really giving us interesting information on behavior. Can you go? Can you go? Yes. Team three. Is everything okay? Yeah, I'll continue. It's okay. I think somebody's on the phone. Sorry. <laughs> okay, will I continue? Yeah. Um, so um, we are, uh, we're working, like I said, first of all, we started with the big aggression thing. And this is just uh, a, a video to show the different uh, streams that we worked on. So this is just segmenting the animals from the background. But the interesting thing is here, uh, we've, in this uh, application, the group started to work on the, the uh, depth imaging, imaging to uh, extract features linked with the pigs jumping on top of each other. So it was already starting to show promise, and that was uh, during a, an early project, and it was published in 2014. Um, and from that work, it became obvious that indeed uh, video, the video approach can separate uh, aggressive pigs from non-aggressive pigs. So that was the real starting point there. Um, but since then, we have uh, gone on to do different things. Like we said, okay, with my colleague who's uh, now a postdoc in, in a university in China, um, we looked at the recognition of uh, the engagement of pigs with different uh, different enrichment materials. So we, we actually put in a pen at uh, different types of enrichments. So you know, the first enrichment was a blue spiky ball. It's this new product uh, that's on the market uh, for promoting pigs to play and pull at the ball each other, promotes play. And uh, the second object was this yellow ball, which is the typical object that farmers would throw into a pen. And also we had the uh, wooden stick. And, and basically we're looking to the engagement of the pigs with these different things. And here we again said, okay, let's use a mix of the, the computer vision and the deep learning. And what we did was we just tracked, well, it was mainly my colleague here who did the work of course, but we tracked the, uh, this enrichment object as it moved around the pen. And we had a zone around these objects and just looked at the occupation level of the zone as the thing moved around the pen and quantified that. And uh, then 
some interesting results came out, and it really became obvious that the pigs they they really like the blue ball. So this ball, which had the spiky uh, protrusions there, they really like to play with that. And in fact, the the, the ball, the, this yellow ball, didn't do a whole lot for the pigs. And yeah, that's why I say, you know, it may not be a case that with all, all these tools that in the end, it will land in the hands of the farmer. But if it helps us to design um, systems that make the animals, uh, yeah, that, that help the animals to become more happy or in, in, more active um, in their environment, well then that's a plus side of these tools. And that's uh, also a motivational factor for us. Um, another aspect is looking at uh, this welfare issue, a huge welfare issue uh, in the pig sector, which is tail biting. And um, it, it's going to become a more important welfare challenge because indeed in Europe we're moving towards uh, the, the intact tails, in other words, not docking tails of pigs. Um, in, in fact, it's not allowed as at the moment, but many farmers can do it, but that will be clamped, on, clamped down on. Um, and for this, uh, my colleague, uh, my colleague Dong, uh, he, he worked on a, an algorithm to detect pigs and then actually apply the ID and track the pigs. So he, he tracked the pigs and then actually uh, did some action recognition, uh, behavior recognition, you could call it, to try and classify the interaction between the two pigs. And here you can see it was clearly one pig trying to bite the tail of another pig. And that's, we had many different cases of different postures in tail biting and so on. Uh, and eventually a model was able to be built that, that classified tail biting. And of course, it wasn't just uh, my colleague, he, there was other people uh, from the vet net in a uh, university in Vienna also involved from the animal perspective. Again, it's, a, it's a really important to have this close collaboration. Um, this is another piece of work that's ongoing by my PhD student currently. She's very interested in, again, in video analysis, but would like to extract more from the videos. So it's not a case that she's not happy with just monitoring the behavior. She really wants to say, okay, can we, um, detect any indicators of, of uh, stress, like change in heart rate or change in respiration rate. Um, and that's what she's uh, trying to do now. We have one publication out. And basically the idea is to look at the, the variation of the brightness of the pig's skin, uh, which you can, you can actually capture uh, to quite subtle levels with the camera. Um, and then extract the noise from that. And you can see once the noise is extracted, actually you can relate the, the changing in the, the pixel intensity to the pulsation of the skin of the blood under the skin, I would say. Um, and that gives, a, 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 that almost directly correlated to the heart rate. So it's quite an interesting approach, which it, does, it has plenty of challenges. If the pig moves, the, the artifacts are, are significant and it becomes a problem to, to capture it. But yeah, maybe it's a, a way of the future if we can find ways to um, deal with the, the motion artifacts. It can be a very interesting uh, approach, I believe. Okay, so I'll move to the, uh, the microphones. This, like I said, I showed you already uh, how the tool was initially developed, but this is the, the end application. It's now on, on the market. Um, and what's interesting is that it's not just about counting pops, which is what it does now, um, but in the research uh, already a number of years ago, it was shown that it can count pops, but it can also separate healthy pops from sick pops. And this is a, a very interesting thing to do because of course you can tell if the pigs are not are just reacting to their environment or if they're really sick. Um, but also, if you can go further than that and link the type of cough with the type of infection, that would even be more useful. And I think now 
the the, the companies are, are working the company is working towards that maybe uh, as a solution i don't know uh, but this is the kind of uh, results that come out of the, the the monitoring system just to go briefly on this so this is a case where pigs were transferred from the nursery to the growing house and the farmer didn't have any overview of this data so he just treated the animals as he would do anyway perhaps consulting with the vet um, but you can see that when the pigs were transferred that initially they were coughing it, it dropped and uh, yeah it, it dropped after a while I guess the pigs were getting used to their environment but then of course you see here this kind of line uh, increasing where the pigs are steadily starting to pop more and more. The farmer did treat quite early, but you can see that the, the pigs didn't uh, take up the treatment quite well and they continued uh, to start coughing. Uh, and it peaked here and the farmer didn't treat until a week and a half later or so. So it, can, it just serves as an indicator that if you have the right tool, if you have the right data, you can really take action at the right time and reduce, um, yeah, have, uh, bring the benefits in terms of improved animal welfare, but also improved productivity. Um, okay, so that's, that was the sound of the pigs coughing. Yeah. Um, this, so they, this is the, the solution that they have. They, they also integrate with other sensors and now they work with Burner in your time to uh, bring it to the market. So it's a, it's a very successful product. What we are continuing to do in our research team is uh, sound analysis for welfare monitoring. Uh, we're, we started work on separating different types of vocalizations and it's still a path of research we're very, very interested in um, because we know that these will be linked with welfare status of the animal. Um, and yeah, we think the future can be part linking the vocalizations also with video monitoring can really give rich information. Uh, we're not there yet in terms of combining everything, but um, I think it's a, it's really as it shows a lot of promise. Maybe it won't end up in the hands of the farmers, but at least we learn more about the animals. Okay, so here is uh, some poultry applications that we, we've been doing. And one of the, the application here, this, this scheme is showing actually a, an overview of a project that we just finished. But uh, just to give you the key parts of this, this figure, um, on the left-hand side, we can perceive that this, this egg is still in the incubator. And what we're doing is we're stimulating the egg with different temperature treatments at a specific frequency, which we figured out in the project. And, um, and by doing that, um, we can actually uh, kind of stimulate the bird to become more uh, temperature uh, tolerant in later life. So in other words, be more resistant to heat stress. Um, we were led by the literature to say that this was possible and it's worked quite well for us and we're, we have some final experiments to go. But, but what we want to do is to control this uh, well in the incubator by using different variables like heat flux, heart rate, which we're measuring uh, just on the eggshell using a light technique to measure the heart rate of the embryo inside the egg and also the eggshell temperature. And by monitoring these uh, indicators, it can help us to determine whether the, animal, whether the embryo inside is actually responding to the thermal stimulation or not. And that helps us understand if it's going to be successful or not. So that's uh, the, the overall uh, approach. And part of that, um, we developed a tool, this sensor for um, and it was primarily the work of my colleague, Ali Youssef. Uh, basically, it's like the, the light-based sensor you have on a smartwatch, but this time we, we uh, designed it so it could be used on, a, on an egg. Um, so it picks up the, the heart rate from day 10 uh, in the embryo. Um, and here, this shows some of the modeling that was done after the temperature stimulation. Yep. 
Sorry. Um, okay, I keep hearing somebody. But this is the the temperature stimulation and the modeling that we de developed based on that. Um, and uh, basically, here we use this dynamic model to actually uh, determine the stages of the embryo development. So we used uh, the behavior of these parameters in the dynamic model to allow us to determine the stage of the embryo. Uh, so in other words, how much it had grown in the eggshell. So you can get that information just by measuring the eggshell temperature. So that's this, this is the kind of work that we were doing there. Sound analysis also is interesting, not only for little chicks, because we also want to ensure that they're not stressed in the in the, uh, the hatchery environment, we can use sound to do that, um, and that's currently what we're uh, working on. But we are we've also done uh, more work on the layer hens, looking at uh, sound as well as an indicator of heat stress. Um, my colleague is Zhao Dongdu, uh, who's working on, on this one. And um, basically, we changed the temperature humidity index and then measured the uh, vocalizations of, the, of the, the layers. And there you see the proportion of, of uh, the different vocalizations changing as a function of that uh, change in temperature humidity index. Um, and so that, that it just shows that uh, also the, the sound um, can be used in the poultry applications as a measure of, of stress. Here, sound as well was used for feed intake monitoring. And um, here the, on this tray where the, the chicken is pecking, uh, we, there was a, a um, microphone, surface mounted microphone attached underneath, and it just measured the pecks that the chicken was uh, giving to the, to the tray. And up here is the raw signal. And uh, one of the, the colleagues a few years ago was working on actually uh, filtering this signal and reducing it to this. So basically, um, taking this raw noisy signal and just converting it to a signal of individual text. And I think it plays here. Oh, no. No. Oh, yeah. it just plays here. So that's the, the pecking of the of the tray by, by the chicken. Um, and once that was uh, done, um, then it was possible to, to link the number of pecks with the amount of feed that was taken out of the, the tray because that tray was on the weighing scales. And you can see there is, of course, as expected, a good correlation. And uh, that it's just very nice to see that such a tool can be used to, um, to, to give uh, information like this, and maybe it can be scaled up, uh, be used by the farmer themselves. But uh, uh, indeed, this is just uh, at the experimental level, maybe we can go further with this in the future. Um, another running, and this is a running project, it's around the, detecting the behavior of uh, layer hens during the infestation of layer houses with red mites. These red mites, it's in, they're infesting layer houses throughout Europe. 90%, more than 90% of the layer houses are infected with this mite. It causes a lot of problems because it uh, actually draws blood from the, from the layer. And because, yeah, over time, when it's drawing so much blood, the bird lose, loses production, productivity, but also, yeah, its welfare is compromised. Um, they sometimes uh, become anemic, they uh, become susceptible to diseases and, and so on. There's a, health, a list of health and welfare challenges that they face uh, because of this red mite. Um, the problem is measure this red mite in the layer house is a real challenge because they they congregate in pockets, uh, in tiny crevices uh, during the day, and you can't see where they are. And then they come out at night when the chickens are sleeping, and then they attack the chickens. So it's a, quite a challenging thing to monitor these mites. 
and the current systems are not at all accurate. Um, so that was the reason for this project, to look in a, into another alternative way of doing it. Um, and here we're applying image analysis again, using video monitoring to detect restless, restlessness behavior while the, while the layer hen should be actually sleeping. And um, it's this behavior then that can tell us whether there is indeed an infestation with these mites. The big challenge with this is that it's not just a small group of, of hens. We're talking about hundreds of hens. We're talking about these hens that are lying, it's sitting on the perch here, they're sleeping, but they're, they're really beside each other. Um, so to think that we could use the fancy deep learning methods to try and track individual animals and, and detect their behavior, that was uh, nonsensical for this application. But in the end, um, we, we worked on a very simple idea. And it, actually, my colleague, uh, um, my PhD student, in fact, Sam, Sam Williams, uh, has worked on this, and uh, he's done a fantastic job. And uh, you see, what he's done is just captured the moving pixels at the edge of each chicken. So each chicken that's showing a restlessness behavior, he can capture the pixels that are moved as a result of that, that movement. Um, and these pixels then are just summed over time. So he, he, he sums every 20 seconds these pixels, and then he goes ahead and does it again, and sums and does it again. Um, and here is another scene below where, again, the moving head, uh, chickens uh, are captured. And he's doing this all the time, and it results in these different, what he, he terms movement maps. And then, after a while, he sums for the whole period of the night these movement maps together. And then these movement maps, sorry, these movement maps give this heat map of uh, the, the movement of the chickens. And you can kind of see the outline of the chickens in, in this heat map and the regions where they have moved a lot. And the way to process this figure then has been to look at uh, the distribution of the colors in this heat map and uh, then to capture the mode of this distribution. And when the mode of this distribution moved to the right, uh, we could tell that the birds were becoming more restless during the night. So it's a very simple approach, but actually it's a very effective approach to try and get the information from such a large amount of chickens. This is more data um, at the left, it's low infestation uh, and the right, uh, the, the high infestation. There's more ways to process this distribution. We just looked at the mode, but uh, in fact, we can get a lot more information out. But it's a, a quite interesting piece of work that he's done there. Uh, I want to fill up, finish up on one last uh, idea. And this is something that my uh, predecessor, Professor Daniel Berkman, has been working on for many years, and he's still working on the, the idea with his spin off company. And um, this is about monitoring individual animal stress using a, an approach called the real-time uh, energy balance. And basically, the idea is to try and decompose the total energy that the, the, the total energy expenditure of uh, an animal into different components. One being the basal metabolism, which is needed for for self maintenance. But then, of course, you have component associated with the thermal, uh, thermal regulation, the heat balance, the growth of the animal, movement of the animal. And the interesting one that's here, the, the right-hand side is the uh, mental state of the animal. So there will be some energy uh, given into uh, the stress of a situation. And it would be very interesting to measure this because if we think about livestock production, maybe this is affecting the growth of the animal. Um, and maybe it's affecting heat balance, and then, of course, uh, it can give rise to other challenges. So if we can monitor this, this component of this energy balance, it would be very interesting. And there was an experiment back uh, in the, I think it was 2009, uh, you just on this horse, uh, the idea was to, to lunge this horse, given this protocol of walking, trotting, but during the trotting period, to show the horse a, a balloon, an umbrella, and this umbrella would frighten the horse, and just measure 
the response of the horse. And it's the response by the response, I mean the, the activity, which is measured on a sensor, which is attached to this uh, strap, but also uh, the, the heart rate of the horse. Um, and then linking the heart rate and activity together. So this is the, the horse being lunged. And this is somebody coming with the umbrella to frighten the horse. And you can see actually in the data that um, the horse was very disturbed at this moment. And, and there was a lot of very weird activity being measured by the, the sensor. Um, and the heart rate, uh, of course, we can expect the heart rate went up. But what's interesting is that the, the uh, heart rate that was modeled just using the activity. So at the beginning, the activity was, mod was used to uh, model the, uh, the, the heart rate. So a model was fit at the beginning. And at the moment when the umbrella was introduced, the heart rate predicted by the model decreased, which was completely wrong. So there was an error there. And this error was what was used to uh, characterize the state of stress of, of the animal. And the idea is that maybe this error and the amplitude of this error can be related to the amount of stress that the animal is feeling at that moment. Um, and that, that, that approach was uh, then followed. And, and a final result, an interesting result was that um, the horse that was being launched actually responded much, much earlier um, before the umbrella was, was shown to the horse. And the reason was the farmer next door in this farm here started up a tractor and, and actually the horse became stressed at this period. And uh, it turns out they were scratching their head for weeks uh, because uh, they didn't know what was happening until they turned the sound on the video and then they saw that uh, the farmer started his tractor. But it's a uh, quite interesting result. And then in, in recent years, back just in 2009, we decided to do a similar experiment with uh, with pigs to see how would the pigs respond to different stimuli. So here you see the pig playing with uh, a cloth, uh, rooting material, they like to play with that. And um, so that was one of the, the stimuli. Another stimuli was a frightening event that we uh, saw a scaring event. And that was the uh, air horn being sounded in, in the room. And again, we measured the, the heart rate response, the activity, and we were modeling the, the heart rate using the activity, uh, first of all. Um, and then we used anything, well, anything that was uh, remaining uh, was uh, con considered to be a mental heart rate. So that mental heart rate was extracted from the, the modeling phase and just here plotted individually. And you could see that uh, the, um, during the scaring of the animal, of the, the pig, uh, the, the heart rate increased a lot, but then kind of dropped quite quickly. You could see it very, very nicely in pig too, that when uh, it, it, it was scared, yeah, it got frightened initially, but then this uh, mental heart, heart rate decreased quite quickly. And over successive scares, it was less and less, of course. But what's interesting is if you look at the, the towel, which is this other stimu stimulant that we used, um, basically the, the arousal was more progressive and slower. Uh, and we can see this kind of linear trajectory, which is much different to the, uh, the, the scare stimulus. So it's, it's interesting to compare. And maybe we can actually classify the different emotions that the animal is, sent, is feeling as a function of these kind of signals. So it's, it's interesting to try and uh, move forward with this. It will be in future one of the things we do. Um, Thomas, okay, Thomas, so- Sorry to interrupt you, Thomas, yeah. the, time, the time is running. We yeah, to... okay, I, yeah, I, I'll, you know what? I'll, I'll go to the end because the, the rest, this is the conclusions now. So what, what I would just want to say is the development of these algorithms needs uh, collaboration and uh, yeah, it needs understanding and agreement in definitions, of course, 
and that's very important. And there's loads of opportunity for welfare monitoring using these tools uh, to translate them into new insights is key, but again, this needs more collaboration. So um, that's where I'll leave it, I think. And I'd like to thank you very much for, for listening. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask me. So maybe I'll stop sharing now. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Will I, will I stop sharing, uh, Barbara? Yes, you could. You could stop. Mm -hmm. Hello. <laughs> Hi, thank you, Thomas. I'm, Hello. Um, Anna, Anna uh, had to leave, so I'm yeah. hosting you until the end now. Does anyone have questions for Thomas? Okay, I have one, and maybe I start. Uh, it's about the different modalities of the sound, the image, the temperature. Um, could you reflect some on the different challenges in working with different modalities and are some yeah. than others and uh, is the technology more developed for some or for the others? So, yeah, what yeah, yeah. Each, each has their own peculiar, peculiarities, I would say. And uh, yeah, like with, with sound, it, it, when you're working on an experimental level with sound, you think this is a fantastic variable because it can tell you a lot you don't, you don't need to have it in a bright environment. You don't need to worry about, oh no, the sun is coming in the window, what's going to happen here? Um, but when you go to the real conditions, the real farm, um, the acoustic uh, environment uh, changes dramatically from one farm to, can change dramatically from one building to another. Like one building might have a lot of insulation, Another one might be constructed mainly out of uh, wood, while another one might be constructed mainly out of metal. And what you register in the microphone is different from one type of building to another. And we don't really realize this as researchers. We think, yeah, okay, um, for, for us, it, it, the, the challenge is solved once it leaves the lab, but these are the big challenges of getting real collecting good quality data in the field. So that's from the microphone side. From the camera side, uh, the, the practical realities are like silly things like dust, um, which becomes a real problem. Um, yeah, especially in dirty buildings and so very quickly. The field of view is also another problem. You have uh, typically, you can cover maybe, um, 20 square meters or so of a field of view. But uh, yeah, the farm buildings are far larger than that. So it means you need uh, many cameras capture that data. Then there's issues with data handling and all. Yeah, it becomes a big challenge to scale these technologies up. Um, with, with the wearable devices, I think in the dairy sector, they've done a good job um, on making these a practical reality. Um, so uh, indeed, you see a lot of cows wearing either a collar or a, a, a sensor on the leg or something like this. Um, and that's possible uh, for pigs. It, it hasn't made it just because pigs are pigs and they will eat a, a lot of things. So yeah, there is challenges. So that's some of them. We have one question about fish. Any comments on monitoring the water or aquaculture fish? Is it possible? Can the technologies you develop be applied in this field? Yeah, it's a really nice question. I, we, we, I have a colleague, one of my PhDs is, is working on fish. Um, at the moment now is working on zebra fish. A zebra fish being also an interesting uh, animal from a welfare perspective to look at. Uh, and uh, because, yeah, this is an experimental fish. And, uh, so we, with, with such, um, such a system for yeah, research level, I mean, you, we don't have to deal with a lot of separate fish at one time. Then it can become possible with, with camera solutions like video tracking, and that's what he's working on. Um, but I think the big challenge is in these big sea cages where you have many, many animals, many fish, and um, 
Yeah, I then think that the technologies we work on are the more, there's more too much challenges with that. And I see uh, people in Norway, the researchers in, in NTMU and Sintef who are working on this using um, acoustic signals to try and get a general impression on the motion of the fish, uh, of the fish um, and trying to link this with, with welfare indicators. So I think the solutions will come. They won't be the same solutions that we see in the terrestrial side. Um, it'll be very specific, but they'll come. Maybe for uh, the, the zebra fish, we will see solutions based on, on cameras. Uh, maybe it can be possible. But for sure, for the, the aquaculture field, it'll be a different type of technology. Um. One more question is about the challenges in getting measurements from individual uh, animals, especially in research. It is a problem if we only get an aggregate measure from all animals in a pen or in a cage, because yeah. it is the capacity to detect significant differences because of our end gets much smaller. Yeah. Something about how you deal with that challenge in your own research. How I deal with it? Well, we are we're trying to produce the tools that will help uh, in this. Uh, in fact, the idea is that yeah, we, this is also an ambition. What we can use less animals if we can capture individual information on the animal, and if we have tracking tools that can that can really capture this information, then yeah, I mean we we don't have to we we can. Uh, manage the amount of animals that we're using in our experiments better. Um, I would say that I would love to be able to say we have tools that will allow you to uh, to reduce and the, this, the number of animals you use and capture more information on an individual level. That's what we're aiming for. That's what we're aiming for. Okay. So if we don't have any more questions, Okay, so thank you once again for coming and giving this uh, wonderful lecture on uh, animal welfare. And uh, it was a pleasure to have you. Uh, thank you very much. Sorry for running over time a bit. Okay, thank you. Okay, bye bye. Bye.